Sorry about that. Oh, God, we instruct you to be faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise and rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Jesus, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. St. Nation of Leola, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. which means the purpose of our existence while we're here. Um, I'd like to also tell you at the end of the class, I, um, I have a first class relic of St. Ignatius. Okay? Uh, if you don't, don't know what that is, a first class relic is, is part of his bone. So I'm going to give you a blessing with that at the end of the class. Yeah, thank you, Father. Thank, thank you, Father. Father. <laughs> It's a huge blessing to be able to have a first-class relic. You have a first-class relic, a second-class relic, and a third-class relic. Uh, there's also a third-class relic here in this class. He's actually moving, and it's uh, walking in front of you now, and it's uh, yours truly because I was ordained by John Paul II. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Got holy hair, huh? <laughs> so there's a first class relic, then there's a second, then there's a third. The third would be uh, with the same touch. So my hair, my head was touched by St. Saint, Saint, Saint John Paul II, so I'm a walking relic. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about St. Ignatius. St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, he was born in 1491. He died in the year 1556. Uh, in this class, I usually like to give a little bit of uh, history. It's, uh, class in which we have the most elements of history in the course, but I think to be able to, be able to understand the whole um, context, the thrust of these exercises, we have to understand the time in which he was living. So I'll mention some of the things that were happening. Okay, uh, King Henry VIII in England, which would be the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in, in England. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, so Martin Luther in Germany would be the starting of the Protestant Reformation in the northern part of Germany. John Calvin lived in Switzerland. He also was a reformer, and he was actually like Calvin, like uh, like Martin Luther. He was a Catholic priest. And then we have um, we have Zwingli and as well as Melanchthon. These are the chief reformers. So the church is going through a really tough time. Okay, right now the church is going through a really tough time in the United States. We've never had a more difficult time the Catholic Church in this country, in the history of this country. So right now, bishops there in, in, uh, in Maryland going through a lot of kind of difficult topics. We're going through a tough time. Uh, so Ignatius was going through a tough time also. 
So being part of the church is to be going through tough times. Also in the 16th century, the 1500s, you have what is called the Battle of Lepanto, which would be one of the most famous naval uh, battles between the Muslims and the Catholics. Thanks be to God that we won that battle. If we did not win that battle, I, who am composed of 90%, I'm not 90% of me is European blood, I would be a Muslim now. Maybe my well, thanks be God I'm not, I'm a Catholic. Because the Muslims would have sacked Rome, they would have taken the Holy Father, they would have established their mosque law, Rome and in Europe, and then that would have been reality. Rome would have been Muslim rather than Catholic. Okay, at the same time you have uh, these are, th these are the negative forces of the time of Ignatius. Then you have um, a woman whose name is Teresa of Avalon. Have you ever heard of her? Yes. Maybe the greatest woman in the world after the Blessed Mother would be Teresa of Avalon. Incredible woman. She lived at the same time as Ignatius. And her spiritual director is St. John of the Cross. And St. Peter Alcantara, St. John of Avila. If we move from there to Italy, we have Spaniards, we have St. Charles Borromeo, the feast that we celebrated a few days ago. The second apostle of Rome would be St. Philip Neri. The Pope will live during the Battle of Lepanto, St. Pope Pius V. So you have, the church is going through a real tempest, but God is raising up great saints. So, uh, applying this to ourselves, all of you are called to become great saints. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen or oh me? <laughs> when you say oh me. <laughs> Amen or oh me. That is equally. <laughs> so all of us to stem the tide of the difficult times that we're going through, all of us are called to pursue personal holiness. morning as uh, we are talking about this crisis in the church among the priests and we have a community meeting every Wednesday and um, told the other priest something that maybe would have taken them aback. I was quoting um, I like to quote the saints a lot. I really love the saints. They're quoting uh, St. John of the Cross. And St. John of the Cross says this, we should all live in the world as if we were the only person in the world. <coughs> now, if you don't interpret John of the Cross well, you might think, well, he's pretty, kind of antisocial. <laughs> but I think that's a, mis a misconstruing John of the Cross. It's not that he's antisocial. What he's basically saying is that uh, the priests, the bishops, all, they're all going to go before the judgment seat of God. So is Father Broome. So I'm going to try to do the best I can to become a holy priest and religious. And I'm going to be judged by Jesus Christ. Mac Carrick is going to be judged and the other, you know, they're going to be judged too. God have mercy on all of us, right? But God is going to judge me on what I've done in my life to try to serve God, praise God, and save souls. And I have to say that the same thing about you people. You're going to be judged on the way you've lived. Not the way your brother, your sister, your uncle, or 
this priest or bishop lived, they're going to be judged in the way you've lived. Hopefully you'll be able to go before the Lord and the Lord will say, well done, faithful servant. We're all going to be judged on our own life. Right? So the exercises uh, will be a tool to help us to really live out, live, live holy lives. Live holy lives. <clears throat> Sure, we're, we're going through tough times and we're surrounded by many obstacles. And I would even say that the, the, the philosophical, erroneous milieu in which we live today is, is very um, noxious, poisonous, deleterious for our own uh, spiritual health. And I would say these are, the, these are some of the currents we have to confront. Materialism which leads to consumerism. Consumerism, which leads to hedonism, and the philosophy of pleasure. And that leads to agnosticism, which is what we see. Maybe God exists, maybe he doesn't. And then to atheism. Those are the those are the those are the philosophical theological trends that are surrounding us. Not only is there turmoil within the church, but also there's uh, there's a certain militant forces against the practicing of our faith, just the in the environment in which we live. So if we're not deeply rooted in Christ, we can easily be swept into neo paganism pretty easily. Paganism means a society in which God doesn't exist. So that's uh, a historical thumbnail um, depiction of the time in which Ignatius lives, I'm trying to bring that into our own context. I hope and pray that all of you will really take these exercises seriously. And I hope and pray that these will be the best 10 weeks of your life. Amen. This is uh, almost all, always the, se the session in which we have, um, uh, in a certain sense, kind of a difficult session because we have Thanksgiving and we've got, we've got Christmas and Christmas Eve and New Year's. But I actually think it, it, it should be the best session because you're ending an old year and you're starting a new year. So you've chosen a really good time to do the exercise. So if I had a hat, I would take it off you, but I don't have a hat, so I <laughs> take off my invisible hat. <laughs> so with your permission, with your permission, I'll talk about Ignatius. I'll talk about a few scenes in his life, and I invite all of you to uh, read his life. And about two and a half years ago, um, from, from the Philippines, uh, pretty good film was made uh, by the Jesuits of Manila, Ateneo. They made a pretty good film on the life of Ignatius, so you might want to see that. Okay? For beginners that really don't know too much about Ignatius, pretty good. Pretty good. But reading his life, also getting out. Getting, uh, his autobiography would be so much the better. Because I'm saying that to understand the exercise, you have to understand the ancients. He's the one that God chose to give us these exercises. What's the name of the movie? St. Ignatius. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, dispel a myth, at least I had. I thought, I thought saints were born saints. I thought they were the born saints. I thought that they probably didn't have to go to the bathroom. I thought they were just um, <laughs> That was my misconception when I was a little kid. But then I recognized reading a lot of the saints. Not all of them really lived holy lives always. Some of them lived pretty.
spicy lives before their conversion. Someone like Mary Magdalene. Right? She was a prostitute. Man. And seven devils with her. How about that? Good thief. That would be pretty good life. He got in the back door at the last moment, huh? I'm always studying, I'm always studying St. Augustine. So, being, having a literary background, I like to read the classics, and aside from the Bible, obviously the greatest classic ever written was the Confessions of St. Augustine. He was converted when he was 31. Not too young. So Ignatius uh, lived a pretty, pretty wild life, but God intervened. I call it a providential accident. Ignatius, by profession, he was a soldier. He was the last of a pretty big family. He came from a family about your size. She had 11 rather than 10. <laughs> yep. But he, he was living a pretty worldly life. Eating and drinking and womanizing and fighting. He, had a, he was kind of a hothead. You know? Got into fights. Thrown in jail more than once. You know? The Hawaiian guy with shoulders would be afraid of him. <laughs> shoulders of East LA. But, Keep away from that guy, no? <laughs> he was a tough guy. So it happened in the Battle of Pamplona. You see that it's pretty well done. Of, of everything in the film of St. Ignatius, that was the scene I liked best. It was the Battle of Pamplona was the French were fighting against the Spaniards. And in this battle, the soldiers under the command of Ignatius says, we, we can't beat them, they're too much, they're too powerful for us, and they've got cannons and guns and artillery that we don't have. Ignatius being an idealist said, we can beat them. We can do it. So you see the scene where Ignatius is defending the, fort, the, the, the fortress of uh, Pamplona, And you see these soldiers approaching the fortress with their cannons and their soldiers and their horses and their rifles and their armor. And all of a sudden, Ignatius is there. You see this, and aiming this cannonball, which takes off and it crashes right through the wall and goes right at Ignatius. And what happens is it goes right at his legs, and it doesn't go through his legs, but it shatters his legs. So there he is lying. The Spaniards surrender, and they take Ignatius off the battlefield. And they really admired him because of his courage. What they do is they take him back to his hometown, which is called Loyola. That was a providential accident. Because there, when he's recovering, something happens that's going to change his life. And it's this How many people here know how to read? <laughs> people knew how to read 500 years ago? Very few. Ignatius knew how to read. So did Teresa of Alma. So what he did when he, when he was re re recovering, he asked them to bring him 
they what would be today Las Matilda Novellas? <laughs> That's what he wanted to talk about. The chivalrous novels of the Middle Ages, the knight in shining armor going out to the beautiful damsel in distress. That's what he wanted to read. But his sister-in-law didn't bring him that, but she brought him the lives of the saints. <laughs> That's the last thing he wanted to read, lives of the saints. So what he did was he spent a lot of time with his imagination, he had a very vivid imagination, imagining himself Mr. Handsome, Mr. Intelligent, proposing to the queen. So one day he maybe be able to marry the queen and he could be famous. <laughs> and when he was thinking about that, he experienced uh, a lot of pleasure on the surface of his soul then he fell into a state of desolation. Well, when he read, read the lives of the saints, it was the opposite. When he started to read, he experienced what is called consolation, peace, and joy, and happiness, and a desire to get to heaven, a desire to bring people to heaven. And one occasion, he read in his life, he said, if Francis can do it, so can I. If Dominic can do it, so can I. If Augustine can do it, so can I. The Desert Fathers can do it, I can go beyond that. And that moved him closer to God. And after a while, he noticed something that one series of thoughts brought him to desolation, another one series of thoughts brought him to consolation, and there we have the foundation of what is called the art of spiritual discernment. And that happens in all of you also. You have a series of thoughts that's gonna bring you to desolation, Another series of thoughts are going to bring you to consolation. We're going to learn how to discern that and what to do and what not to do. That's part of the course. It's a preview of what you're going to be learning. So as he's covering, recovering, he had to have an operation in which they had to they had to break his leg without without anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And then he noticed, Father Tim put uh, points out in his new book, that the um, surgeons were not very good because there was one bone knotted on the top of another bone near his knee. That wasn't very pretty. So he told the doctors to get a saw and to saw it off. Mm -hmm. and, uh, about a protrusion of about an inch, getting a saw and sawing that bone off without anesthesia. Did you do that? <laughs> Thing he did was he, he, he clenched his fists and that's all he did and he was able to undergo that torture and martyrdom. He's got a strong will, doesn't he? Once he's converted, he's going to be placing all his energy for the honor and glory of God and for the salvation of souls. <coughs> so finally, when he's strong enough, recovered enough, he decides to become a pilgrim. And he's going to be visiting several places that I'll tell you about. And each of those these places has a very important meaning in his life as well as for us. First place is he's heading off to the sanctuary, Marian sanctuary of Montserrat. Montserrat was a Benedictine Marian sanctuary. A 
on the top of a hill. As he's heading there, he bumps into a, to a Mormon, and I'm not a Mormon, but a Muslim. And they start to discuss things, and they talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the, the topic surfaces about the perpetual virginity of Mary. Mary was virgin before the birth of Christ, during and after. And the Muslim says, that's crazy. The perpetual virginity of Mary, that's impossible. Ignatius gets so angry that he's driving on his donkey and they arrive at a fork in the road and he says, wherever the donkey goes, I will just follow. The donkey goes up to, to most rock, fine. But the donkey follows this guy, I will kill him in honor of Mary. Thanks be to God that the donkey was a Catholic donkey. <laughs> 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 he was studying the fifth commandment before he took off. <laughs> I'll tell you how to kill, okay? So he arrives at uh, Montserrat, and when he's there, he's applying himself to silence, prayer, meditation, and examination of conscience. So examining his conscience. He spends one night, the whole night, before the Blessed Virgin Mary, consecrating himself to Mary. And the Blessed Mother gives him a great grace. And it's the grace of perpetual virginity. Which he's been living a pretty wild life. The Blessed Mother gives him this great grace. It was the sins of the past, the sins of the flesh that maybe be part of his life. He just he experienced a real repugnance for those sins, which is a huge grace. God is going to use him to do many, many great things. But he had to attain this, this grace of purity. Which you're going to read in the life of the saints. God is challenging them to conquer the flesh conquer the devil of lust in their lives. But while he's there, he also examines his conscience and he prepares himself for what is called a general confession. General confession will be confessing all the sins of his life. Once he prepared, he found a priest he went to confession. The general confession took in between four and five days. Imagine that. I didn't say four minutes or four hours. Four and five days. And the priest was so impressed by the, the highly refined conscience of this kind of weird guy. <laughs> walked with a limp. What a, what a refined conscience. So that's the highlight of Montserrat. From Montserrat, he goes to uh, actually a cave in Manresa. Now, in Manresa, he spends about a year. In Montserrat, he's basically in a state of consolation. In Manresa, he's spending a good block of his time in prayer and in works of charity. But he's alternating between some consolation but a very powerful desolation. And what you have is that the, the devil is attacking him with what is called scrupulosity. Scrupulosity is this. Now you went to confession, but 
but you know, you really didn't confess that well. You didn't get all the sins out. You really weren't that sorry for those sins. He's being tormented by the, by the devil. <coughs> and he was tempted to commit suicide. <coughs> and do it next to the dark. He was really, he was really being assaulted by the devil. His saving grace was that he would go to a confessor, he would open up to the confessor, and then he would obey the confessor. That was his saving grace, as was the saving grace of St. Faustine, if you've ever read the diary of St. Faustine, same thing. But God allowed this because he was going to give to Ignatius, there in the cave of Manresa, one of the greatest graces in the history of the Catholic Church. He was praying in the cave of Manresa, and the Blessed Virgin Mary appears to him. And the Blessed Virgin Mary gives St. Ignatius the spiritual exercise, which we're doing now, 450 years later. We have a picture of our founder looking into the cave, and Ignatius is there with a the pen, and the Blessed Virgin Mary is there, and he's writing down what the Blessed Father wanted him to write down. So these exercises are very Marian. Amen? Amen. Amen. Any of you have devotion to Mary? I wrote my second book on Mary. I have devotion to Mary. So these are these are going to be marrying spiritual exercises. Place yourself in the hands of, of the Blessed Mother and just going to go really well. So we over, he, he received this extraordinary grace and then he heads off toward heads off toward um, he wants to go to Jerusalem visit the places where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ lived. But he encounters a lot of difficulties. When he arrives there, after a lot of struggles, the Franciscans, who are the custodians of the Holy Land, tell him to go back to Europe. He said, after all these struggles, I'm not going to go back to Europe. So they lift up these documents. You do not, you're excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Because back then you had the Muslims that were threat, threatening to kill the Catholics, as is happening today, right? So he went back. He goes back to Europe. Italy and Spain, and what he's doing now, he's given the, he's given the spiritual exercise. Now the program we have here is a 10-week program, it's called Annotation 19, that I wrote about 12 years ago. So the program that I've written is called Annotation, it's an adaptation. His original exercise would be, you go off to a, a place, and you're with a director in total silence, and you meet the director once a day for a month, and that's it. And he gives you what you're going to meditate upon. Then you meet him the following day, and this takes a whole month. That's the original form of the exercises. So what I've done is I've taken these Ignatian topics in 10 weeks. And then you, instead of you meditating you know, five hours a day, you'll be meditating one hour a day. Well, we pulled together all the Ignatian exercises and themes in 10 weeks. This is called Annotation 19, which is the spirit of adaptation. I don't think any of you can go off to a retreat house and spend a month there and meditate five to six hours a day. I don't think you could do that yet. Maybe you can. But this is not the context of that. 
hopefully one day you'll be able to make a 30 day retreat. Okay? I've made it and I've given it. You know? But this is for kind of busy people who are working, parents, um, adapted to your situation. Now he's given the exercises one on one, and the uh, the uh, Spanish Inquisition, the church authorities draw close to him, and they say, "What the heck are you doing? <coughs> Who are you to be directing these spiritual exercises?" Don't forget, he's not a, he's not a bishop. He's not a priest, he's not a deacon, he's not a subdeacon, he's not even an altar boy for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a fourth, fifth grade education. But the exercise he's giving to farmers and priests and bishops and lawyers and doctors, and the net result is radical conversions in one month. Irrespective of the social class of the individual. And they say radical conversions. People living very, very bad lives and the desire to become a great saint in one month. They come in, what the heck are you doing? You don't have any theological preparation to do this. They say, stop giving the exercises. He keeps giving the exercises, then they throw him in jail. So he gets out, gives the exercise, he's thrown in jail again. <laughs> and it finally dawns on him that he's got to go back to school. So he goes to Alcala, then Barcelona, and Salamanca, these are cities in Spain, you've never heard of them before. So he finishes his elementary education, his high school education. And he keeps studying and he ends up in the most prestigious university in the world back then, which is not Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Dartmouth or UPenn. Have you heard of those, the big guns on the East Coast? They're called the Ivy Leagues. No? Or rather, he was at the University of Paris, where earlier, who taught there was Thomas Aquinas, and the saint that we celebrate tomorrow, who is, of course, Albert the Great. Mm -hmm. Alberto Magno, who is the teacher of Thomas Aquinas, okay? So what's happening is he's, he's, uh, He's a holy man, and he's kind of like a magnet. And he's drawing other people to him. And he's given them the exercises, these young men. And they're transformed. So he's got a couple of roommates that are studying with him. They're a little bit younger than he is. And the two roommates, they're polar opposites in temperament. <clears throat> First one is uh, kind of a quiet, introverted, timid, kind of a complicated man, suffering kind of some depression, low self-esteem. They would say a lot, a lot of psychological baggage we use in modern jargon. But at the same time, with all these problems, if I can use the word, uh, he, he, was a, he, was, he was a genius. A lot of psych, but he was a genius. Did you ever meet one? Ignatius gave him the exercises. He was converted. He became the greatest expert in giving the exercises in the world after Ignatius. And he's a canonized saint, canonized by 
Pope Francis two years ago, and his name is Saint Pierre Favre. Because you're French. <laughs> Peter Favre. He was the greatest expert in the world. You see what happened through this exercise? He was able to get through this, these problems. The Holy Spirit purified him. He became the greatest expert in giving the exercises after Ignatius himself. His other roommate was the exact opposite. We call him a party animal. He was an extrovert. He loved, he, he just loved the city life. He liked to dance. He liked to party. And today, he would be, he would, he, he would win a gold medal in the Olympic Games. You know what? The high jump. He would have been one of the best in the world probably in the high jump. So not only was this guy, this guy was also a genius, but he very different than the other guy. But he was proud as a peacock. Cocky, arrogant, proud. And Ignatius said, hey, why don't you do the exercises? And he said this, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? Ignatius rebuffed him. And he said once again, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and he loses his soul? He kept pushing Ignatius away. So, you know, he, got, he gets a doctorate in philosophy. So he's teaching there. And he just sends students to his class. He's going to win them over. So he ends up, he ends up without any money. Nasus gives him some money. He's, he's going to win him over. He's not going to give up. And finally, he says, what do you want me to do? Go through the exercises. So he does the exercises. And Nasus says, this was the hardest nut to crack. <laughs> the hardest nut to crack. But after he finished the exercises, like his companion, he heard. So the first guy, Favre, is the first. He actually decides, Ignatius goes with a group of them to Montmartre. They make vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Favre is the first one to be ordained a priest among the Company of Jesus in Spanish. Then Ignatius heads to Rome and asks the Holy Father if this group of men can be approved as a religious order. The Pope says yes. And what's approved is what is called La Company de Jesus. We call them the Jesuits. And they're had four vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and faithfulness to the Pope. Now, what has happened is the Pope wants to send priests to the Far East to do missionary work. We ask Ignatius if he can give a couple of these men to be missionaries to the Far East, to India. They said, give the couple, but the two of them get sick. And he turns to his friend, the cocky guy, who now has become his best friend, and actually his secretary. He says, will you go? Will you obey the Pope? He says, yes. And he says to this young man, go now, go now, and set all on fire. Now it's set all on fire. So he goes to Portugal, he embarks, and he travels a long, long way. He ends up in a place called India, in the city of Goa. And he's preaching and teaching, converting hundreds and thousands. At the end of the day, he can't lift up his arm anymore. You know why? Because he's baptizing so many. He goes from India to Indonesia. Indonesia, and he ends up in Japan. And he's converting the Japanese. He's got an idea. The best way to convert the Japanese is to convert the Chinese. <laughs> because the Japanese admire the Chinese. 
So he said, I'm going to go to China. So there he is, working so hard. He's exhausted. He's got a fever. He's on the island of Sanchan, overlooking mainland China. And he drops dead of exhaustion at 46 years of age. And the name of that man is the great, and I say the great, St. Francis Xavier. So I've told you the story of three saints. <coughs> St. Ignatius, St. Peter Faber, and St. Francis Xavier. All of you are called right now to be the Latter-day Saints. Not the Mormons. <laughs> All of you are called to become great saints. Mary, I think what we'll do is I'll change my idea. If we can maybe sure. take about, we're going to take about a uh, three to four minute break, and we'll come back. Because this session, this session is just a little bit longer because I have to give you more information. So if you can maybe just stretch out Maybe I have to go to the bathroom, come back in three to five minutes, and we'll give the second session. Okay? Yes. Okay. So thank you. <laughs>